This is the OGM Weekly Call on Thursday, August 11th, 2022. I'm going to turn the transcript on as well. How is everybody? Pretty good. Doing all right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'm OBE. OBE, which is overwhelmed by events. Oh, I thought you were just made a member of the Order of the British Empire. That'd be pretty cool. Can you arrange that? I don't have that much suck at court. <laughs> I would settle for other courts, the Estonian fact, court, perhaps. Well, there you go. Yeah. In fact, I have no suck at court. I, could, I don't think I could find it on a map. <laughs> Hi, Grace. <laughs> Hi, I'm on hold with my credit card company trying to figure out some security things. So hopefully I'll be with you 100% in a minute. Cool. Well, that's sort of only half pleasant for you. Um, yeah, I had a, I had a, I've had a going back and forth with PNC now since January, trying to set up auto pay on a mortgage that wouldn't set up. And so it's finally, I think, fixed, but it's like back and forth. Um, Marshall, good to see you. Hey, Jerry. Excellent. And Rick as well. Um, so there's a conversation brewing. Uh, today is a topic week, so it's not a check-in week. We won't go through, through the, the Partridge family windows uh, in front of me. But rather, um, there's been a topic bubbling up in, in I think that's the Brady family windows, not the Partridge family, Jerry. I <laughs> was like, I'm not close enough to the, to the like, no, I didn't watch enough of those to have it like right at hand. So I, I shot for Partridge and I missed. <laughs> you met Hollywood Squares. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, Hollywood Squares would have been easier. And in fact, I used to have a Zoom background that had me, like that had the squares around behind me. In, in the early Zoom days when that was actually even mildly funny. <laughs> um, Zoom no longer being a, a matter for humor, now being our, our prison, our modern prison. Uh, but it's a prison that liberates because, look, I get to talk to all of you like on a regular basis and we don't live near each other. Um, so there's a question burbling around, which is, uh, should OGM have a purpose? Does OGM have a purpose? What kinds of things should OGM engage in? What could OGM do best? Uh, in conversations over the last two plus years, uh, we have um, uh, wrestled with this at different times in different sub-conversations uh, in different ways. And so uh, I think it'd be interesting to peel the question open and see if we can't address the question in some way that leaves us uh, with a couple paths of inquiry or with a couple of uh, sort of insights. So I, don't, I don't know that we can answer the question here, but uh, I wanted to share... Um, I wanted to share uh, from my brain for a second, uh, just some, uh, a little bit of inspiration and then uh, open the floor up to see how we want to structure this. But here's, uh, here's my thought for today's call. And uh, here's a thought that I created some time ago. In fact, I created this June, 2021. Uh, and it was under sort of OGM objectives. Uh, and I actually had uh, a, another nice thought called OGM effects if we succeed, uh, which I can come back to in a second. But I will also give everybody a link to, in fact, write this minute so you can wander around by yourselves. Give you a link to this, uh, this thought in my brain. So feel free to open that in your own browser. But let me just explain what I have here and then go back to, to the call. Um, and this is the ambitious wish list of what an open global mind community might engage in, right? So, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of jump around a bit, but um, we had a bunch of conversations about the generative commons, uh, about what the notion of creating a generative commons. So we might actually nurture generative commons in different places, uh, which would mean things like mapping, sharing and connecting uh, kind of everything or causing things to be connected and mapped, meaning uh, if we could catalyze a bunch of different communities into meeting in a global mind, uh, that would be pretty cool. Um, 
we, OGM could become a bridge for the high functioning entities out in the world, organizations, nonprofits, for profit <laughs> startups that are already working on all parts of collective intelligence, but working on them in lots of different uh, dissipated separate uh, uh, places. Uh, so that would be a really interesting thing to do. Uh, we could bring emotional intelligence to political and other charged debate. This could be sort of an effect of, of, of participating, uh, of doing some of the other things, but bringing also sort of the heart. And uh, per Charles Blass's suggestion long ago, I got the domain openglobalheart.com or .org, I'm forgetting which one, but but we also have that in case, in case that's useful. Um, help wise initiatives connect and amplify their reach, which is connected to the bridge of the high functioning entities. But it's like, how do we find wise initiatives that can connect and amplify? And Rick, you had asked something on the OGM list that I think is somewhere in this realm, but I wanna come back to you uh, to see if I can understand better what you were uh, talking about as launch pads. Um, honor increased uh, diversity in all we affect. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't have on this list something that I think I've thought of since then a lot, which is uh, be of aid to communities not like us. Um, <clears throat> so that uh, I will add that here in a second. Um, host experiments and challenges of different kinds in order to uh, pioneer, let me connect this back to um, Pioneer new needed practices for collaborative sense making. I think that's uh, connected to um, prototype missing pieces. So, recording in progress. There we go. Um, so, um, basically, host experiments and challenges. Um, identify missing pieces in the knowledge web, sort of point out where things might uh, might be missing. Uh, make <laughs> wisdom easier to use, uh, which is a big one for me. It's this idea of how do we uh, instrument wisdom so that they're easier to understand and, and, and set in motion. Uh, mm -hmm. And here I have a thought that I created. <clears throat> um, there's the one, two, four, all. Uh, I will have to come back here because I've got a page that, that uh, on the uh, Relate Wiki where I talk about how do we turn this pattern into an actual uh, bit of code that would help us in Zoom, for example. Uh, so let me go back here. Uh, we talked about those. Pioneer new needed practices for collaborative sense making. Um, let me connect that to collaborative sense making. Um, present visions of OGME futures, which I think is important here. Uh, another one is promote idea sex, uh, which is how, how do people with ideas actually uh, exchange ideas and improve them? Uh, another way of thinking about this is how do you swap DNA with wise organizations or how do you help wise organizations swap their own DNA? Uh, somebody might have figured out a good way to, to uh, mm -hmm. track and monitor and reward value exchange through a network. Great. Um, how do you fold that into uh, the, four, the, the pieces that you're using? And then uh, I think that's it. I think those are all the, the nodes that I had put in here before. Let me stop the share and... Uh, and see what anybody thinks. And maybe... Um, Maybe Rick, if you want to uh, start us off a little bit by riffing on what you had said and whether or not it fits into the things I was just showing and uh, if so, how, what, where, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I was using the, the idea of a launching pad <laughs> as an aggregator of people who want to focus on a particular area. Uh, I mean, I have a particular area, I'm sure everyone else has a particular area, but how you can make networks around those particular things. And the idea of a launching pad is to have some sort of either academy, community, micro community, which can expand over time. And, um, you know, taking it from a, a complexity perspective, you know, how do you, how do you create your sort of mycelium network that can weave together a social tapestries in ways that we can actually take on these wicked problems, these self-inflicted wicked problems. 
That's I, I like I like that a lot. That seems very uh, it seems to me very resonant with conversations we've had before with some of the things that just showed on screen. Are, uh, are you comfortable with that? Are, are, oh, there pieces, no, are the big pieces missing? No, no, no. It's not so much. It's no more, not nothing missing. It's more enhancing and uh, sort of thinking about where you might have sort of more concentrated areas, which would be long term activities uh, rather than projects, which tend to be you do a project, you finish it. Um, I'm thinking of a cause that there are causes that we take on where there is no end because the, the problems, you know, wicked problems don't go away. You're going to continuously trying to work around, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, thanks, Rick. And you're also reminding me of something that I'm trying to sort of visualize and explain, which is the difference between a mission for a project, mm -hmm. which is long term and, and works over time. Uh, uh, which I sometimes talk about as, as painting as a mosaic. Mm -hmm, um, right. And uh, Wendy McLean talks about as a tapestry and, and others of us may use different kinds of metaphors for, but then how do you decompose that into what I call tiles because of the mosaic analogy, which I like a lot. How do you decompose that into tiles, which are in fact time bounded, parsable, separable, modular, composable, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you preserve how do you have the, the long-term continuity and vision of, of mission and, and a painting of something larger that you're trying to get done over time, but then still make it uh, just running down and will eventually turn into just a manageable small pieces and die in a so uh, Mike a big, big freeze. I think that is Mike's. Oh no, that's Doug's. Uh, I think it's Doug. Doug, if you will mute, I think that was coming from your computer, but I'm not sure. Um, Grace, you have your hand up. <clears throat> yeah, so many things. But I think what I want to point at at this moment is that the problem, the question are framed in a way that are hard to address. And a lot of times just asking the right question really makes the conversation go somewhere. And in some ways, this isn't the truth, but in some ways, one way I'm interpreting this question is, wow, we've been meeting for a while and I'm not sure anything is really coming out of this group and who, well, what would that look like, right? And I'm not sure that's a great problem definition. I, I feel like I want to define the question that you're asking better, Jerry, before we start answering it. Um, and you're reminding me, Grace, thank you, that also several people have expressed, hey, um, I love this community just the way it is. And we get together and we mix stuff around and I meet people I trust and that's just fine. And I'm not trying to break that uh, with this particular inquiry. I'm trying, and I think that there are some of us in the group, uh, there are a bunch of us in the group, as Rick just said, who have our own projects. We're trying to get a, a boost, a lift or a fix or, or, or some support or even participants or funding. Awesome. Um, there's a bunch of us who are just here for the, the ideas and the camaraderie because we care about the topic. And there's a few of us, and I don't know how big that number is among us, but what percentage it is, who would just like to get on some project and really put a bunch of effort into something that, act, that fixes some piece of this larger mosaic, some piece of this larger vision. And I'd love to make, and, and we have time and space uh, being limited only as time and space are limited we could in fact have lots of different subgroups doing things that are very substantive and very very much on, on you know, project plans and, and so forth. And that needn't change the Thursday calls or other sorts of rhythms we have in the group. We could easily coexist. And then the energy of those things could come back in and feed us uh, here in this place. Um, also, I just wanna sort of acknowledge that we've been talking for a long time. We're not, a fabulous group at getting a lot of things sort of done in the world. We're, and and I, I will I will carry that a lot. I love convening. I'm not a uh, not a really great uh, producer, operations person, or whatever else. And we've done some lovely work in lots of places. I, I feel like we've digested and metabolized and synthesized a bunch of things that matter to this space, because I feel like my understanding of an image of and desires for this space of a shared uh, civilizational memory of some sort have gotten way further than when I than we when we started this series of conversations uh, concurrent with lockdown. <clears throat> so that's working really well for me. But thanks for putting that in that conversation. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, one um, one thing I'm I'm struggling with here is 
the dynamics that are in the system right now. So I can just talk about you know, food and agriculture and, and my, my food system sector here. But right now, the, the US government, for example, just allocated out of nowhere $20 billion to, to uh, assign to conservation districts. There's no system in place to distribute this money adequately and fairly um, because <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the folks who are focused on you know, regenerative agriculture and, and uh, uh, you know, community-based systems and so on are completely unprepared. On the other hand, you look at corporations, you know, dairies and, and, and uh, K4 operators and so on, they have game plans on the shelf. They are, they are preparing for this thing. So like it always happens, you know, there's uh, money coming in from the government and it's being mopped up before it reaches the intended audience, which in this case would be startup farmers, community-based businesses and what have you. So it, it is very difficult to establish a communication structure and, and, and a uh, um, organizational structure that is that is not able to then deal with these changes where you can't can just jump you know to here's the next uh, challenge to focus on and and I don't know how how to develop that um, I mean I have a meeting in fact right after this one here with the American Sustainable Business Network and I'm alerted the group of saying you need to think about this um regenerate america and and, and, and you know kiss the ground and all uh, how are we going to deal with this because now as you go and this is the donella meadows you know hierarchy the dissolving into um, ever more complex parts of the economy each community has totally unique issues related to restoring the environment, watersheds, soil repair, and things, and forestry, and so on. And so, the the conservation uh, programs are super uh, customized towards towards very uh, the specific local issues that you need to deal with. And so, if these programs are not not keyed up and prepped, they're completely going to miss the window that is opening up now to appeal for this kind of funding. That's just like one example, right? Mm -hmm. how, how the landscape around you is constantly shifting and changing and, and how dynamic this all is. So to share information, to be able to share information across broad platforms, um, to, to highlight these kind of aha moments, right? Here's the next thing to focus on. That is a service. I mean, that's good stuff. Yeah. So um, correct. Tell me if I'm paraphrasing you poorly here, but I wrote in the chat. Um, how can we? How might we identify systemic failures and seek to improve them? And that's probably a ni much nicer way of saying that. But partly, you're describing a, a couple different kinds of high-level failures in the food, agriculture, regeneration uh, kind of a space between government budgets and farmers on the ground. And there's lots of other things there. And we've in all of our conversations, we've seen how complicated each of these different segments and sectors is. But having like a an eagle's view with a systemic eco an ecosystemic brain that understands how to look at these sorts of things, in which case I'm using brain not as the software, but just like mind, I think that would be really helpful. Does that cap I mean, and then it gets specific when you talk about food and agriculture and farming and all that. But is that the more is that a general description of what you're saying, Klaus? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call it systems failure. Um, it's just the system isn't ready to 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 morph into this new reality that just unfolded and, and adapt itself to here's what's now happening and there's a limited timetable to deal with it. <clears throat> I mean, United the, the conservation districts, I mean, let me just digress for a moment because I had this this great aha moment in the last webinar that, that I organized for that moderated for this workshop. Okay. There are over 3,000 conservation districts in the United States, the <laughs> county of America, and that was formed during Roosevelt's uh, 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 regime during the 1930s, during the Great Dust Bowl, when, when American farmers needed science support and also uh, funding resources to, to recover from this enormous failure. Well, these are still in place, but they have been defunded to the point where they are becoming you know, marginally useful. Um, but this, this system could be mobilized and, and scaled up again on really short notice 
if provided that everybody understands what they're doing and what their mission is and uh, and and engage here. So there is now a, a hyper community level engagement required, which I'm trying to set up here in Bend in my community you know, to bring the city council and everybody into motion of saying you need to craft this opportunity here as it unfolds and you need to jump ahead of the curve. So that's not necessarily a systems failure, but it is the need for a systems adaptation that was unexpected or should have been expected, but was unexpected and is not being prepared for. Um, thank you. I like that a lot. And also, um, I suspect that there are a lot of high functioning organizations out there that are relics of some other movement that survived some squishing of bureaucracy that whatever, like, uh, you know, um, seed banks or who, who knows what else. There, there used to be the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, that did really interesting work. There's a, um, I'm thinking of uh, farm, the farm credit system actually was really, really important during the, the depression and then morphed into something else that was still high functioning, I think later, and I don't know, but how do we, how do we find the high functioning elements of the system and improve their role in the system, something like that? Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to generalize a little bit. Let's go Marshall Doug uh, Gill. Well, hello. Uh, I have only recently begun participating here, uh, but as I look at it from the outside coming in, it it feels important to me to be thinking about what the what the unique contributions that this group could make uh, are and what some of its its uh, unique strengths are. And it, it feels to me like the the tools and the paradigm and the brand and the experience of connected knowledge and people with connections are are something that uh have been building here for years um uh, and offer uh, a, an opportunity uh, for the the group to play a, a catalyst type role uh, across a wide range of loosely related interdisciplinary uh, organizations seeking to build a, a more networked sustainable world uh and you know i I mean, I, that could mean a lot of different things, but uh, my my mind always goes to uh, let's all chip in and hire an ombudsman type uh, role to go out and do the work uh, to connect to other organizations and bring uh, bring all of this uh, historical network knowledge uh, to help amplify the the seeing and the thinking and the and the doing of of all kinds of of related organizations. Um, Marshall, thank you. And you're reminding me of conversations we had early in OGM's history about what we called outreach. And one of the questions that burbled up immediately in terms of, hey, we'd like to reach out to high functioning organizations or whatever else was, okay, great. So what do we tell them we bring? What gifts do we bring? Uh, what is our secret sauce? What is our, our special magic? And we, we kind of stumbled on that a bit because we don't have a platform that they can use. We don't have a methodology they could adopt. Uh, we've got people of goodwill with geek gifts, as Eric said in the chat, um, with a lot of insights, but we haven't organized that in a way that, that's really um, easy to absorb or transmit, which could easily be a, a goal of ours. And, and, and again, I wanna say I'm, I may be putting too big a set of goals in front of us, uh, given that we are a community of practice that likes to meet in salon format on Thursdays and then a bunch of sub conversations that are trying to do things. But I'd love to aim high. I'd love to to see, you know, how much we could get done. I I, I wonder if the organization or, or, or representatives of it could act as consulting historians to organizations it, it seeks to, to support. I like that. Um, Historian, oh, historians is sort of one of the perspectives, and I think the systems perspective, ecosystem thinking perspective is another perspective, and there's a, a couple different things like that, uh, lenses that we can offer, uh, plus tools and practices, and I think uh, Pete and I are, are big proponents of a whole bunch of things are practice, not necessarily tool. It's how, how you get a community together to do things in unison in, a, in some way that we're agreed on doing, um, and I think lots of others of us care about that as well. Uh, Thanks, Marshall. Uh, 
Doug, then Gil, then Doug. Uh, Doug Breitbart first, sorry. You are muted. What, there you yeah. go. You found the found the button. Sorry about that. What what um well well one micro thing, Klaus, in your share, which is this money is allocated, everybody goes hooray. The substantive real deal not ready yet distributed grassroots node to node folks aren't set up. And the commercial interests see it as here's another huge pot of gold to siphon. And they are set up to do that out of the government, you know, out of programs, whether aligned with the programs, aspirations, intentions or not. Right. And so that's, you know, how that black wolf keeps getting fed and perpetuating itself. But on a larger sort of pulling back into space, really back into space, um, there is an aggregate um, capacity in the room, in this group, to, to really be able to put arms around really big, complex realities. Um, both on, a, on, on the nitty gritty Jerry of your brain, you know, down to the granular level and pulling back, pulling back into, you know, buckets, subject matter domains and buckets. And, and if everybody's reference-based, knowledge-based awareness um, and all of the accumulated references and links and artifacts, awareness of artifacts and, and pre-existing stuff, um, could be aggregated into a platform where the mission isn't to solve a specific problem. <clears throat> it's to actually do a, a massively multivariate um, uh, aggregation of all of the stakeholders and all of the elements that could be identified and there's almost an AI dimension to this, um, of having a broad enough reference space and the, 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 a platform that builds the lexicon around a particular issue in a particular location for a particular population um, in real time. And, and that's a, that's sort of a living thing that is within reach technologically. Like we have the capacity to do, to, to put those pieces in place. We have the capacity to do batch uploading and integration into a, a master base, a master reference data set. And we have the beginning emergences of AI capacity to do the pattern matching. And um, that's sort of, you know, instead of looking out at the carrot, that's grasp beneath our hooves that's already present and accounted for from an ingredient standpoint. If there was a collective will or, or a group of people were interested in actually operationalizing it, putting a stake in the ground. So I, I throw that out um, as a contribution. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Um, and Marshall put into the chat uh, the purpose system that you and being in systems have as a as a good example for what to do, um, which I I totally like missed that road for a second for a second. So thank you. Um, Gil then Doug B Doug C then Grace. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, good evening, Grace. Um, I I like what Doug said, and I want to return to that in a moment. But first, a comment on what Klaus had said earlier. Klaus, I was really struck by what you said about. Um, uh, folks aren't ready to receive the flow of resources that's coming at them, except some folks are very ready and have contingency plans on the shelf. Uh, and it's easy to dismiss that as a matter of resources, like, you know, they've got departments that do that and we and we don't, we're all just, you know, kind of getting by each day, but it's also an orientation. And I think, you know, given that we are in a world that is going to be changing a lot fast all the time, um, developing the capacity to anticipate 
the things that might be coming and be somewhat prepared for them, be prepared to jump into action on things, on, 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 you know, true surprises or perhaps expectable surprises, I think is a really important talent and capacity to cultivate. Um, um, so thanks for that, Klaus. Um, back to what Doug was saying, I think you spoke um, a version of what was in my mind um, as I think about ODM and what our purpose is here. I, I'm not here looking for a new project. I'm one of the people who's got project pretty busy, but yet I keep coming here even though I'm busy because there's something going on here that's with enormous richness and value for me. And Jerry, I kind of listened to your overview <laughs> Uh, in in four dimensions, um, uh, you know, four tendencies that I that I hear uh, in this in this bunch of humans. One is uh, is an inclination to want to solve everything. It's kind of one in one end of the of the pole. A second is to be useful to people who are working on cool stuff that we care about. Uh, a third is to be of value to each other uh, in the things that we're each working at, and the fourth is to be a pub where we gather together. Uh, and not to minimize that, because um, I'll, I'll I'll speak for me, but I'll speak for all of us. We are all changed by these conversations. You know, we, we are different people by virtue of being in these conversations than if we weren't. So, you know, from the most action, let's fix everything to the least action, let's just hang out and talk. There's value all across that spectrum. Um, I don't know where to put us in that. I'm I'm completely satisfied if this is just the pub that that you know shifts us each a little bit and enriches our lives a little bit uh, i'm not inclined to trying to solve everything um but in between you know being of service to each other and being of service to others uh, are interesting challenges and um on the being of service to each other i like we're uh, i like the, i like the stake that doug stuck in the ground just now as a possible conversation to explore further that's it Thank you um, very much, Gil. Doug C. When I speak here, I usually try and impose on myself the discipline of only saying things that might possibly be helpful to the whole group. And it defeats me this morning because I can't think of what that would be. Uh, we're a bunch of smart people uh, that are uh, just spread all over the place. Uh, and as a result, we're not very strategic about what we're doing. Uh, and maybe that's who we are. I think Gil's view that this could be the pub is real. Uh, whether we could do more than that is still iffy. Uh, I'd love to think of what it would be. Uh, one of the problems right now is that new institutes are springing up all over the place in reaction to the cr multiple crises. Every university is creating new departments of ecological strategy, one kind or another. Uh, we're in a, context, in a context where all the things we might think of doing, somebody's already doing. So where is the strategic lever in all this? Uh, my own sense is, if you look at the whole landscape, that the, the lever, and I've said this before, the, the, the leverage point that's available is the algorithms that are going to be used to manage society in a crisis. And this group could possibly with its multiple connections out into the Silicon Valley and finance worlds, uh, have some impact on the way the algorithms develop. Uh, are they gonna be used as they are now to heighten tensions or are they gonna be used to uh, moderate solutions? Uh, one of the, th th the context for me is the building tension with China, which is just stupid. Uh, the U.S. is acting like it's a failing hegemon that has to fight for territory uh, rather than working cooperatively with China. And we're very close to a bad war. Uh, things like that. Can this group even have uh, a strategic view about such things? I just don't know. Anyway, I don't want to run on because I think it's clear that I'm not clear. Um, Doug, thank you for your clear on clarity. That was actually really helpful for me on, in a couple of different ways. Uh, before I go to Grace, I just wanted to put a couple of things in the conversation. One is, as I think I sort of said a little moment ago, everywhere you look in the problem space that we're in, somebody's doing interesting and great work. Um, 
you know, I don't find a lot of people with an overarching view or vision for how these things fit together nicely and what a civilizational memory might look like. When I start talking that language, I, it's crickets. It's, it's like, whoa, I don't, I don't see where that is. And I bump into a few people here and there who, who've got that in mind, uh, but don't necessarily have an organization or, or, or whatever else. But, but the weaving together of these things into some distributed, capable, reliable, trustworthy, helpful, useful uh, memory and prototyping breadboard and whatever else it could be, I don't, I don't necessarily see that that's happening. But, but again, if you wanted to go talk about distributed identity, if you wanted to go talk about, you know, mapping and, and all those things, there's lots of interesting community work being done on all those kinds of things. And then I have a strong view and desire to live in and be the Chuck Yeager of this new memory, like infrastructure, scaffolding, whatever you call it. I call it the big fungus now and then. But I don't know how much my particular view or vision of that overlaps with everyone here and with, with what OGM is. I actually don't really know that. And I haven't been able to externalize that vision other than riffs in conversations here and a couple essays here and there, and then putting a whole bunch of stuff in my brain, which is, this, <coughs> which is sort of famous by obscurity. Sorry, Mark, I'm gonna mute you for a sec. Um, um, so I, so I'm, I'm trying to sort of figure that out a little bit because I'm, I, I sort of see this thing pretty vividly. I've got a, I've got a pretty vivid picture of, of what could be and how it could influence education and science and journalism and all that kind of stuff. And I and we have a tremendous number of connections into all those spaces. I mean, we just know a whole bunch of people who are doing important stuff in all those areas. And if we could kind of release the Kraken, if you'll forgive me the expression um, of human wisdom and compassion, so that we could help each other, I think is a really big thing sitting right there that we could help tip toward connectivity, toward reliability, trustworthiness, all those kinds of things. And we're we're kind of touching all the moving parts that are needed to solve for that problem. Um, Grace, then Rick, then Doug C. Wow, every time somebody talks, I have a different thing. Um, but I think- it Happens to me too. Experience. Yeah. Um, which is why we love these conversations. So I've been aware of this lately that I come to these conversations and I went to a similar conversation in a different group and it, that people aren't really all, you know, we're all working on our separate projects or not all of us, but quite a large number of us. And we're looking at uh, like projects and objects and maybe, so it's like there's, there's sort of things that, that so there's things that like if we're just a pub right then we're just a pub but there's also something like can we one of the things that's really bothering me is waste right and duplicated effort and can we at least be an organ that says hey you guys are doing mapping and these 20 other organizations are doing mapping and by the way the answer to that so far is no right because there is a mapping group and i've like plugged in stuff and there is pretty weak receptors for this may be a duplicate effort and why don't you just join hands with some other people right so we have pretty weak receptors for that kind of like you know hey jerry's got this great vision and it's like yeah well that sounds a little like the consilience project couldn't you just call up daniel schmachtenberger and see if you're doing the same thing and like i don't know what the receptors are for that right so that's one thing like is like, are we in any way committed to trying to eliminate duplicate effort or just tell our members, hey, I think that project might be a waste of time. Maybe we should put your efforts into something else, right? Like we have, I think we have no taste for that at this point, but I think that would be a minimum thing we could do for one another is just be really straight and be like, hey guys, you know, we're going to have an intervention because you guys are going off on a tangent and spend a lot, like, that might be something. And what would that look like, right? What would the council of people, like, what would you have to do? What would be the procedure for saying, hey, let's stop those guys going off on that tangent over there? If that were something we wanted to do, or maybe we're just like, hey, let them, that's it, it's the pub. Who cares? They're, you know, they're drinking a little too much over there, whatever. <laughs> but this also brings me to this thing, like, maybe what we're doing is a kind of, maybe what's interesting is a flow. I was, I was, I was 
looking at CRM this week, and uh, we use a we use a project management tool, and the project management tool was arguing that it's a CRM tool, but actually it does that as task management. You know, these things are really complex, and it's just not designed right. So, but maybe where maybe mapping those flows would make a lot of sense. Like this is what a good project definition looks like. Okay, Klaus. You know, if you fill this out, we'll understand what you're up to. Jerry, if you fill this out, we'll understand what you're up to and which resources to plug into your thing. And then once we've started to plug those in, we kind of know that step one looks like this and step and like kind of a, you know, something that helps us move those flow, that really map those flows of the project rather than something that does the project. Feels to me like it's in line and, you know, Kevin's got a really, like, something that actually is more like a CRM that says this is what the flow looks like from ideation to funding to execution and we are your accountability buddies in the flow. That might be really cool because I think that would also eliminate this kind of duplication of effort waste thing because we wouldn't have to do an intervention. We'd be like, okay, look, I'm looking at your project definition and I see na 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 and you don't have clear objectives or whatever use cases. Or, so I feel like that's kind of that idea of a flow of supporting one another's project might have some richness. Um, thanks, Grace. Uh, the meta project has a sub project about maps and mapping that Vincent and uh, Wendy McLean are in and a bunch of people have been attending, which is trying to collect up information that would feed some of some of this. Uh, Pete and others uh, have this belief that everything is a project, which I like a lot. And when we, we haven't made that a rigorous part of our process or anything like that. Uh, and then I'm, I'm reminded of some high functioning processes or, or methods that, that exist in other communities like the writer's workshop process which in which uh, a bunch of writers share their works with each other uh, they pay attention to one work at a time that author steps out of the circle and the work is addressed not the author in order to not be critical of the author like wow what a stupid person had this idea but instead there's a process that you step through to say this is what i think that idea wanted to be and this is what would make it more of that and then answer questions and so forth. And it's a it's a process that that is different from an intervention metaphorically, as you would with somebody who's got an addiction or whatever else. Uh, but I think if we if we picked a couple of these and had just a place for these things to stand up, and whoever wanted to step into one of those circles for a particular set of projects could then join forces. One thing I think we do moderately well and very informally is mix people together who want to talk, because we hear somebody say, "Oh, I've got a project that whatever," and we're like, "Hey." I've, I've known two people in the past who uh, who were doing that and um, and uh, you know you ought to talk or maybe even some of us convene that conversation and say hey why don't four of us meet uh, you know in in the zooms and talk about it and I've seen some coalescing connecting through that but but it's this is a little bit like the world of philanthropy where um, you scratch five philanthropists and they've got six different projects and huge overlaps, but not that willing to collaborate or fold their projects together. They like having their projects. It's a lifestyle business. And I think I think I think there's a little bit of that going on here, which is like, hey, we, we have our vision and our vision's cool to 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 guard to like garden and carry. And I'm I'm certainly guilty of that. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's the people who turn those visions into running code and functional communities and whatever else that that I think caused the changes that we're that we're looking for. Um, so something like that. So thanks for triggering all that. Uh, Rick, Doug C, Stuart, Dave. And I just wanted to say one of the reasons why I show up, um, and that is because I am I'm attracted to the idea of sort of the meta level thinking of, of looking at things from a visionary perspective, but that's only part of it. it. It's also a question of how, you know, zooming out and zooming back in and how can you make connections with people? And I'll just tell a brief story because it's emblematic, which it, uh, things have probably already happened in this group. But I, I, I went to a clubhouse group called Global uh, Change Agents, and I presented my idea there. It was a brief presentation. And uh, one of the people who were the organizer was a guy called Ed Morrison, uh, who'd written a book on strategic doing. And, he, and his, his take home message was, you know, Rick, you need, better, you need to have more partners uh, in what you're trying to do. 
And so I followed up with him and I said, you know, I'd like, I'd like you to be my partner. <laughs> so he was willing to do it. And as a consequence of that, um, uh, we're in the process. I, I submitted a conference to a, a research meeting and I, I put something in pretty spontaneously, did it over a few days, submitted. I thought it's not going to get accepted as a pre-conference workshop. But it did. And the title of the workshop was, uh, is how can we handle the wicked problems of health inequities more effectively? Now, you could substitute health inequities with any other because there's lots of wicked problems out there. So it's really, you know, the challenge of dealing with wicked problems. And then on top of that, I, I'm, I'm setting up a, a series of, of five um, Zoom meetings. We're just doing it, uh, just planning it, and it's focusing on the whole notion of what he's developed over his career uh, of using complexity thinking to do strategic doing. Now, the interesting thing about his work is that he developed it in university. And now he's disseminating it across different universities. So, you know, in terms of thinking about scalability, having an official affiliation with an institution or center or an academic center where you develop something that's dealing with complexity whatever domain you want to you know, zoom in on um, and trying to develop a learning program. So I'll certainly tell Ed ab about this group and invite him, to see if he'll come along and share just a little bit of his work because he's already gone down that track, but he's very much at the, he's at the do, he's a doer. I'm a thinker, I'm more of a thinker. And you need thinkers and doers working together and it's a false dichotomy to say, you know, the people who do don't think and the people who think can't do. Uh, it's it's a false dichotomy. It's a question of how you can bring people with different mindsets together and seeing where you can create your synergies. Um, thanks, Rick. Uh, you're also reminding me that as of, I think yesterday, I'm a fellow at uh, RMIT, which is the in Melbourne. It's a technology school and they they created a senior practitioner fellowship at the at the Center for Future Skills and Workforce Transformation. And it says, our role is to build an innovative learning ecosystem at scale, create new collaborative applied research, and invent next generation skills solutions that will catalyze workforce development in the future oriented industries crucial to Victoria's economic renewal. Um, if I could so just that, briefly respond to that, it, it, actually, Ed, who'd done his career in, in, in more in the business sector and political sector, he went that back to do a PhD to sort of summarize his life's work at the end of his career and got his degree in Australia, but I'm not sure if it was there or not, but uh, having academic connections is critically important. Indeed. Um, Doug, then Stuart. As I listen, I think one of the models that describes a lot of the people in this group is the commitment to something that, that we could call an aggregation model. Let's bring together all the resources that we have and see what it adds up to. The problem with an aggregation model is if the strategic ideas are not in the subset, so to speak, they can't be selected into the aggregate. Uh, let me give an example of what I mean by strategic. Uh, there's a lot of money in the new Biden bill, a lot. Uh, the problem is that it all is to stimulate new economic activity. The problem with new economic activity is it creates more CO2. Hey, there's some logic there. Do we believe in that logic? I just don't know. I think we're going to hold on to our aggregation approach uh, and not move to strategic levels of thinking. End of thought. Um, thanks, Doug. And we need to be more and less systematic and rigorous about how we approach these things, which I think would solve a piece of what you're saying, because then we would get the strategies in the aggregate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Stuart and Dave. So uh, I'll try to be brief in making a contribution to the word salad that I'm hearing. And I've got a bit of COVID brain, so uh, uh, pardon me. Um, one of the things that, that pops up that, I, that I'm wondering is, um, and the metaphor that came up is, Jerry, are you the facilitator or the CEO? Okay. And in some sense, the question for you is, what do you want to do? OK, where do you want to drive this? Because you seem to have a lot of kind of I, I, I hesitate to use the word control, but I'll use it a bit of control over what happens with the dialogue and, and, and where it actually goes. 
And we've been in these wonderful divergent conversations and there's a lot of brilliance that's here. And the, the question is, and I know it's come up, do we wanna continue this as a pub and just continue in our wonderful drunken <laughs> stupor as what happens at pubs? Or do we wanna bring it into a convergence of some kind so that we can do something that's useful? One of the thoughts that pops up for me is, every once in a while you will flash Jerry's brain, okay? Now that could be the essence of something really useful as a resource to a lot of different places because in some ways it's your harvesting of all of the things that have popped up in these conversations. And you probably more than anybody else have an idea of what's in there and how it might be useful. That's it. Mm -hmm. That was a whole bunch of stuff, Stuart, thank you. Um, so I clearly don't think of myself as the CEO of this or, or sort of a similar sort of thing. Um, I do see myself as a shaper of it and instigator of it, and I facilitate our conversations here and in so doing, help choose the topic, manage the conversation, do whatever else, and that's sort of a part of the structure here. Um, we've tried a couple experiments with, with diversifying that a little bit, and, and we haven't really done that much, but um, but the funny thing for me is um, I, the, the thing I've bitten off as the thing I would love to see and do is larger than I can envision seeing and doing sort of myself or with, a, with an organization. So I'm trying to talk about it out loud with other people who have their own ideas about similar sorts of things and how to solve these problems and try to find a way that we can remix and connect and amplify one another's efforts and slowly materialize um, a, a high functioning uh, social network and software platform that satisfies a whole bunch of us and might actually then attract a bunch of other people to do something interesting. And this is all, I think, way more complicated than Wikipedia because Wikipedia is meant to be an encyclopedia and they discovered wikis they built the Wikimedia engine, which is the, the only piece of software they kind of need. There have been other side projects and so forth, but, but Wikipedia is this, you know, all consistently among the 10 most trafficked uh, websites and is like frameable. And this is not frameable in that way. This is a lot goofier and squishier and needs protocols and APIs and ontologies and who know and, and communities and all that kind of thing. Um, so thanks for asking that. I think I wandered a little afield from your question, but let me go back to the to the queue here. We've got Dave, Klaus, Grace, Mike. Just to briefly comment, Jerry, somewhere within what you just said it was an articulation, at least I heard an articulation of what this is, whatever this is. What I also wanted to say was, you know, making a distinction between um, a democratic process and, and, a, and a much more directive process. Um, sometimes, the, though we, we tend uh, to value kind of democratic process, sometimes a little bit more direction uh, and directive uh, is a really good thing. Totally agree. And, and, and I don't think we're a democracy in any particular way. We don't vote on anything. We don't like the, democracy has a bunch of things that, that we're missing entirely. We're more like a community that meets in a pub. Uh, that has a couple of projects to build like a model airplane and a quilt and a couple, you know, a couple other things. We talk about them and I'm trying to figure out, am I Ted Danson? I'm really more like Cliff Claverin, which is unfortunate, but like, you know, how does the, how does that really work? Um, Dave, over to you in the booth. Hey, thanks. Uh, I mean, at least Cliff delivers the mail, right? Isn't that the guy? Uh, I think he does, although he seems to be in, in the bar all the time. So I don't know. Um, so, and for you younger people, now, um, the I was thinking of, I mean, I, so I guess I'm kind of riffing off of uh, Stuart, what you were saying, but also I, Grace, I was going after the project idea that um, it kind of from, I feel like the, a lot of the global regeneration collab stuff is a similar kind of feel as to this. It's a whole, you know, kind of the coffee shop thing. You know, we do lots and lots of Zoom meetings, but they tend to be smaller than this. Um, probably more diverse, I would argue, but, but you know, um, it's still within a very specific realm bubble, I think that we're, you know, we're living in. And my observation has been that, you know, there's two kinds of people, there's two kinds of projects. There's, there's a few projects that have come kind of from the community working together and discovering something that they're going to collaborate on. That's really rare and hard. 
And then it's much more common that people have an idea that they've got their teeth into and they want support for their project, right? It's their idea. And I kind of feel like it's much, it's probably more productive because there's so many more of them to help people with their idea, right? Than it is to pretend that somehow magically we're gonna create a, a group idea. Um, this has been my, 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 I think that was Dave who froze and hopefully not me because I see everybody else still moving. Okay, good. Um, that, was, that was super interesting too. Uh, so Klaus, Grace, Mike. But it's a great look on Dave actually. <laughs> I, I, Somebody get a screenshot. Oh, too late. <laughs> ah, too late, too late. Dave, you're frozen. I, yeah. I, apologize, I apologize for Vermont Wi-Fi. It's not my fault. Um, I was just saying that we could, we could, cross uh, threads on project presentations, if you were at all interested. And I can imagine having projects that coming into the GRC that are we gonna have presented by the owners uh, and have OGM people show up at those for conversation and discussion. And I think of it a little bit as adding a stage to the pub so that you've got a, you know, another set of a, another product line that you're, the pub is offering kind of. Thank you. And, and we could go into ciders, we could do nitro beverages we could do like smart water who you know, like for a global brain what do you need you need smart water for god's sake uh you set up a green egg back you know exactly you know what they um, say jerry if you're drinking smart water it's not working <laughs> <laughs> that is so nice um Klaus. yeah let me throw in maybe another wrinkle here uh, we are really living in a very transformative stage. And so we have a dysfunctional political process. 90% of the US media is controlled by six corporations who have a keen interest in maintaining the system as it is. Uh, and so the, 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 what, what is emerging in groups like ours, but you know, across the spectrum, uh, LinkedIn and, and other discussion groups, is a sharing of information that was up till now not readily available. So what, what, what wants to emerge, what seems to want to emerge is that same level of synchronization in the off-channel, let's call us off-channel groups that you see in, for example, the uh, Alec and uh, the, uh, uh, the National uh, Associations for Farmers, for uh, all kinds of professions, because the industries are, are highly organized and structured, you know, and they have people on standby, working full time to think ahead, where may this go, what's to our advantage, but it's uncoordinated, it's sub-optimizing the economy, which you know, is where we are basically. So the challenge now is to, to, to create some sort of synchronization of what is reality, what is real, right? Uh, so in my case, what constitutes regenerative agriculture? What is this thing? No, so not that you, you can have some greenwashing coming through. The same is true in the energy sector and other places. To have, to have an understanding of, of best available science, best evidence-based information, no? and, and cut through all these distortions and, and the noise that, that you are surrounded by. And 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 I think once once we achieve that, and I think we will get there because you can't put that genie back into the bottle. As more people uh, share information, communicate with one another, um, that synchronization will place. But right now we are in the middle of a transition period, and it could go wrong. Right? I mean, it's not to say that it couldn't go wrong uh, because the political process is in so much turmoil. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Klaus. You're making me want to be a part of a cabal of systems ninjas or systems hackers or, or sort of a, a well in, a white, white hat systems hackers or something like that, where we're just kind of pushing and tipping and we, we meet at the pub to compare notes and figure out what's up and, and so forth. Then we break off into sub projects that are in hope, you know, hopefully substantive in different ways, uh, boost each other's projects and then come back in and share like how it went and what we learned, et cetera. But and the piece we don't do that well that would help a lot is to have a better shared memory for what we've figured out in all these adventures and, and how this all works. So it's not only storytelling at the pub, which is actually super, super important anyway. Um, Grace. I want to step back to the 
step over something that you said, Jerry, uh, which was something like uh, help. Like I have this idea, I have a clear vision of what I want to do, and I know that I'm missing some of the capacities for that. And uh, I want to jump in and say, well, how about we help you with that? Like how about we start to actually be a kind of group that one of the things people can say is help yeah. and conduct a meeting and say, this is my vision. This is what I'm missing. Help. And, you know, it's, oh, can I get louder? I don't know. Can I? I can, can hear I? you pretty well, but you're- Am you're... I louder now? Yes. That oh, really good. good. I press a variety of buttons. You're actually louder um, than, than the rest of us now. Well, what else is new? <laughs> Keep going, though. I love what you're saying. So, like, I think it's so hard to say help, isn't it? Yes. And um, so I don't want to step over that. And I want to say, yes, I have a lot of the organizational background. A lot of the people in my space, the crypto space, and I think a few of the people in the room are very good at doing things on their own and not great at getting people to do them together. And that happens to be a skill set I have in training that I have. I'm certainly happy to offer it. Um, and um, whatever it is, yeah, Jerry, why don't you like, or any of us, why don't we create a format, which is like the you're allowed to say help format, where we bring people into the room, we present what we need to present, and we say, this is what I'm missing. That's complete. I like, I like that a ton. Thanks, Grace. And I think the idea of office hours was some intention toward this without much structure and without much publicity or whatever else. But the idea that, uh, hey, I'm going to I'm going to work with my garage door open. Anybody who'd like to come by and work. The idea is not to have a salon conversation, but rather here's the agenda of what I think I'm going to be working on for these hours, which lead toward the thing I'm trying to construct. And then anybody who feels like it drop in. And, and I've had a hard time figuring out what are the sequence of calls and topics that I put on my office hours because I'm not thinking systematically enough in, in some sense there. Uh, so Pete's pointing to the page, which I haven't updated in, in a week or two, but I would love to because that's that's actually, I think, a place where this can start, at least start. Gosh, there are so many euphemisms for help. Aren't there? Um, thanks, Grace. Mike. Uh, just to give a little history on this, uh, Jerry, it, it may be useful to think back to what you and Esther Dyson did back in the in the 90s and early, early aughts. Um, you built this incredible community. You brought people together and showcased important new developments and mega trends. But I, I thought the most important and, and enduring product was release 2.0. 1.0. 1.0. 2.0 was the book. Right. Um, but the point there is that if you look at collaborative processes that spin off great new initiatives, you know, not, not open source projects that bring people together to do something together, but instead these these hubs, strange attractors that bring talent and people with problems together and then spin off little teams that go and work with them. The, the two things that happen is that there's an event and, and today they can be virtual. In the past, they were in real life. And there's some kind of written product that gets put out on a regular or semi-regular basis. And that written product is really important. I mean, it, it, it's in some cases, it's just a bunch of people who throw out a manifesto and say, hey, we're going to go work on this project. Join us if you can. You know, here's here's seven slides in, in, in the world I'm very familiar with of Internet standards. It's actually a draft standard that a bunch of people at the Internet in, Internet Task Force or the World Wide Web Consortium decided was needed. And they iterate, 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 and the process is pretty open and transparent. So there's a lot of ways for people to feed into the process. But I, I, I love 
thinking of release 1.0 and PC forum uh, as a model. And, and the, the big difference, of course, is that we're looking at an even broader landscape and an even more global group. And we have these tools now to do things in a virtual way. But I, I think the discipline of having a deadline for a, a, either some kind of meeting or some kind of written product is, really gets people to move forward and implement. Um, Mike, thank you. You've just, just opened up how, how much work that would be. You've just opened another great can of worms uh, and a timely can of worms because next Tuesday I will be in New York City uh, to attend this event, which is at Betaworks. Uh, Betaworks is hosting a tools for thinking sequence of events leading to a think camp where startups apply uh, and go through a filter to be in a, in a Y Combinator-ish kind of setting later uh, this fall. Uh, but the first event is this half day session at Betaworks where I'm gonna interview Esther. Uh, and uh, so exactly, this is gonna be like an old home week. You can sign up and the live stream is free. Uh, attending is like a hundred bucks, uh, but uh, uh, that's gonna be actually really fun. Then separately, it's really interesting because um, the PC forum, the conference we used to organize was this highly produced event that led me to invent Jerry's weekend retreats out of frustration. So, so um, I had gone to a bunch of different things that were about uh, like pro group process based on trust. So uh, Quaker meeting, uh, Bohm's dialogue process, uh, uh, open space technology, Harrison Owens thing. I had training in all these things and that mixture of things sort of was a contrast to this high visibility, uh, high attention personal computing forum uh, that didn't really sort of work for me. Uh, so that's really interesting. And then one of the reasons I left Esther is that I was writing a newsletter that had a circulation at its peak of like 1800 copies that we know a lot of companies would receive unstable, maybe a, a Xerox and then could send out to everybody. Um, and that because it was captive was never gonna sort of make the rounds in the way that information today makes the rounds. And I saw that there were all sorts of people writing really intelligent things for free in open in blogs and, and all this stuff that was emerging at the time. And I'm like, that's the way, that's the way this ought to work. It shouldn't be protected like that. And I will add that I can't stand writing under deadline, although I wrote under deadline for a dozen years for Esther and before that for New Science, which really made me happy and, and like put work in the world that I created that I'm very proud of a bunch of which I've just scanned. So I will find, uh, I have a Google Drive where I scanned all of the continuous information environments research that I wrote back in 91, 92. And if you if you look through it, you can sniff smartphones. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting and kind of fun. So anyway, sorry for all those different things, but I think you're right about deadlines, you're right about written output, except different from what the protected newsletters, you know, protect, over-protected IP might be, but but this medium wants us to be sharing more of what we know and what we do in that place. Uh, last thing I'll add is I'm looking to recruit more people to be scribes or map makers or context weavers during the sequence of events at Betaworks. Uh, so please contact me if you'd like to be one of the scribes. Uh, there's a page I've got up for scribing these events uh, and whatever tool you'd like to use is a welcome tool just to figure out how to start taking and sharing notes together uh, through that sequence. Uh, Rick. Yeah, I'd like to, to return to the purpose of this meeting. I'd like to, to um, contextualize my comments based upon what Stuart and Grace said. Um, and I don't know what version you are in terms of um, open global mindset, but I think there's sort of almost a, implicit a, a, a call to action to raise the game in some way. And so I, I, uh, I, I think Stuart's comment is right on the money. Uh, in terms of, you know, somebody has to take it, you know, what the next version of this enterprise is. From my perspective, I see it more as an ecosystem and a hub, but that's just a perception. And it, is it really a hub? And if not, then how can it become a hub? And what would it look like? So uh, my, 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 uh, my call to you, uh, Jerry, is thinking about what you would begin to document or put down, you know, you know, vision, mission, credo, et cetera, et cetera, you know, into a sort of 
sort of how to revitalize the group, but then use what Grace was talking about. So if, if you were to prepare something uh, or update something that we would all read in advance and use the methodology that you were just talking about um, you know, with Grace, you're then getting the, the wisdom of the crowd adding into where you're going. And that, I think, the, one of the things I find with new organizations, and I'm, I'm sort of you know, on, the, on the fringes of other ones, it's very difficult when you're on the outside to know what is the governance, what is the vision, what is the mission? You, know, you don't know all the people. And the process of doing that will create um, you know, relationships that would help to enhance the next version of this enterprise. So that's my two cents. Agreed, Rick. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carranza. Unmute. Um, uh, post in chat. Bing. So I um, am asking for help. Um, basically, I've been working for 38 years on the foundation of a global mind that is evolvable from personal to global. And uh, I've been thinking about it for a while, been working alone, and uh, I'm moving out after cancer to, uh, you know, try and uh, take some of that healing and compound it into uh, um, shared healing. I gave a talk at uh, um, the 2600 um, hope.net and people said best talk in the show. So um, that's happened several times, but I've only talked about it about four times. So um, it's happened three of those times. Um, uh, love to present here, but presenting Friday at archive.org's Friday meeting. Um, which, which anybody could attend. Do you want to offer the link? I just posted the link. Oh, good. Thank um, you. Sorry, I didn't um, see it. I have a specific ask. Um, oh, good. The second link, or I think the first link, um, is the proposal for a talk at DWebCamp. I'd love comments and questions in the comments so that they're shared by people. Um, is there one more thing? There certainly is. And um, our friend Eric reminded me of it. Um, hi, Eric. So, so basically, we have a small group um, about developing MX Further um, on the Mattermost. It's closed, but we're going to open it. Um, and that's about it. Um, and uh, thanks, friends. Thanks, Mark. Um, the Friday meetings at the archive are fun. They're, they're like, you get a real sense for what's happening at the archive. They sort of go around and do some internal business and then they have a guest speaker. They start with some music, uh, totally worth attending and free to attend. They love people coming in, so please do. Um, and Grace reports that the Zoom isn't the right Zoom link. So if you wanna double check, don't use this. Yeah, don't use it now. It's very likely in action. You yeah, know, please. Um, yeah, so that's that's an interesting problem. I'll think about that problem and probably um, simply post in the um, the um, uh, Mattermost channel um, when I can figure out the right solution to that problem. Um, I do live um, uh, journaling I'm using uh, my memory experiment or uh, mind experimental um, named after the MX missile to kind of like fuck that zoom fuck that meme of uh, a doomsday uh reagan device into uh um submission with something uh that might be better um let's see bling 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 i think that's it um uh oh yeah um check out the live um notes in the channel uh the channel would be the, the channel that you posted earlier in the chat which is in our mattermost servers that's it town square Thanks for that, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Cool. Um, oh, wait. Someone else was in the queue and they just unqueued. I've forgotten who was there. Um, and we're getting close to the end of this call. So, um, Mr. Homer. Um, with regard to what Clea just posted, um, I was thinking about this before the call of, um, you know, OGM, I, I love this pub. A lot of my friends are here in this pub and I like the grog, um, but I have to say it's mostly a bunch of old white guys. And, you know, if we're really about creating something in the world out of OGM, we have to have way more diversity than we have. Because right now, 
I'm I I'm an old white guy myself, and I'm tired of following old white guys. I'm tired of reading old white guys. I want to know, you know, what other people are thinking. My character is formed by being the fat by the fact that I am an old white guy, and I recognize that people who have different skins and different genders and different ways of thinking and different backgrounds think very differently than me. And if we're going to be open global mind, those voices need to be here. And until they're here, we're just an old white guy club and i i'm happy to be here it nourishes me deeply i love everybody on this call i've had fantastic conversations built relationships here it's terrific but it's not satisfying on the level of a global movement um it just isn't there so i just wanted to throw that out there another thing i wanted to say was um you know as a facilitator i'm always looking when i'm charged with creating some kind of project of not what information do I need to convey to people, but how do I create the conditions for them to think together effectively so they can solve their own problems? So I put that as a question for Open Global Mind. How can we create the conditions for people out there in the world to think more effectively, um, to solve, Rick's mentioned a couple of times, you know, wicked problems. If you approach a wicked mess with a problem-solving mindset, you're going to make it worse. And yet, I would say probably 90% of the people I encounter only know how to think in problem solving mode. They don't know how to think wicked problem mode. So um, how do we shift that? How do we create the conditions for people to start to think differently? Just a couple of things on my on my mind as we go through this call. And Kalia, it's really nice to see you here. Um, haven't seen you since the fabulous facilitator days. Welcome. Yay, same here. And thank you for bringing this up. This has been a constant uh, thorn in my side and I would love to um, figure out how to solve for this. Um, Gil. Yeah, thanks, Kalia. Hi, Kalia, and thanks, Ken. If those, those are just a couple of things on your mind. I shudder to think what else is going on in there. Um, yeah, you know, um, maybe other people who are different than us don't want to come here. Maybe this is not interesting. Maybe it's interesting to us and not to other folks. And so, you know, we keep on saying, let's invite other people, but they're not coming or they come and don't stay. So maybe the problem isn't the inviting. Maybe this is just not of interest to them. Clea, I'm, I'm curious to know what you see as the cultural programming that makes it such, um, either if you want to speak now or offline. Um, maybe the thing for us to do is not invite people into this group, for, but for all of us to get out of the pub more and go to other communities and hang out there and listen for a while and maybe participate eventually, or maybe not, or maybe come back here with some insights, but um, you know, this is not the only pub in town. I've been trying the frequent other pubs uh, strategy, uh, which works some, um, and I think it's, it's um, well, Grace says in the chat that she'd love Kalia to, to jump in. Kalia, I don't know if you want to jump in on this issue here. You don't have to, but it, we would love to hear from you. Oops. Sure. Hi. It's nice to see everybody. It's like, I'm like, I love this. Like, it's fun. There's like people I know from lots of places and that I've found and hung out with in the past. I think, um, <clears throat> Like what I, what I'm saying, like what I meant about, I think it's like really complex these issues, right? So I'm glad that I feel safe to bring them up and I feel this group will listen and try its best to understand what I'm saying. It's, um, which is, you know, I run, I lead a community that is full of lots of white guys, but it's also a cultural space where it's safe to invite women and people of color and they'll probably have a reasonable time. Nothing is 100% perfect ever, but, the, and they usually come back, right? And if I come, like I'm here today and I'm like, oh, I can't invite anybody to this space because they're going to show up and it's not going to be a friendly, comfortable space with a low probability of something weird happening in terms of a negative experience, right? So that to me is the, like, there's, there's, you know, understanding, you know, one example is like Western universalism and it's, 
you know, it's beauty, but also it's limitations, right? If there isn't a cultural awareness of that and an openness to understanding that as a kind of blind spot that we have in the West, then it's really hard to, you know, that's one small example, but to me, it's like, it's not just quote unquote diversity training, yada, yada, yada. It's this deeper kind of what are the cultural patterns? What are the conversational patterns? What is the, the discomfort with people not talking? So I just led a conference this week. In fact, it was the internet identity virtual, virtual half day event that was centered on Asian time. The majority of the participants were based in Asia and Asian. Most of the people who talked in most of the sessions were white guys because there was a discomfort in one, there's more time and space open, I believe in Asian conversations, but also just a, a discomfort with the non-speaking that meant they kept filling with the time that opened up instead of waiting for other people to take up that space. So anyways, those are my thoughts. Um, and to me, it's, you know, yeah, it's complicated, but I think it's possible. So, Kalia, um, one thing I'm, I think, quite aware of is that some people are daunted just by the conversation here and by jumping in or turn taking or being present that they, they, um, I've, I've heard and seen that no problem with that. I, I get that. Otherwise, I don't get other than the occasional and I think infrequent statement by somebody that's not sensitive to something, but I don't get how this is a high risk setting for other people to come into. I am not understanding that at all, other than it's statistically overwhelming because this is, turns out to be a, like a bunch of older white guys. So can you clarify, can you help me see that? I feel like I'm blind to something that's sitting right in front of me and I'm, not, I'm really not seeing how this is an, a hostile group. I, I try really hard to be welcoming, to be even-handed, to make room for people who don't look like they're talking, to pay attention to people who've tuned out, all that kind of stuff. And, and so I'm not getting how this is a high-risk setting. Uh, I don't want to, okay. Um, would I invite a woman I work pretty closely with, Shereen Mitchell, who leads human first tech to this space? No. Um, she's African American. We run human first tech together. Um, she occasionally comes and visits the identity space that I work in. And that's like, it's just like who we all know diverse, not like I know lots of diverse people. Is this like, it's complicated, Jerry. It's a very subtle feeling and it's not like, um, maybe one of the other women can talk about like, why don't you invite more women you know to this space? That's a question to ask. To, that's like a way to start getting at where the really subtle challenge culturally is. And Pete's okay. saying some interesting stuff in chat. Yeah. Um, can Jerry, I have an answer yeah, for you on that. Um, Please. When I first showed up here, uh, whenever it was a few years ago, I was very daunted. There's a lot of heavy duty intellectuals on this call. And I'm no longer daunted because I realize there's also a lot of really great soft-hearted open-hearted people here but the it was hard to speak up and i've i've witnessed on calls here several people saying wow this is you know i'm i'm afraid to speak up and these are smart people so i think that's part of it is that the intellectual level that goes on here is challenging and if i was a young person of color a young woman of color coming in here i'd be like do I speak up and tell these guys what I think is going on? I mean, that's a big risk. So from in your, through your glasses, Hey, I'm a nice guy. I try to pay attention. I, I, I look for people participating or not, but for someone coming in with a very different lens, 
it's going to be it's going to look quite different and i don't think that we have done enough to a invite people and b to create a safe hospitable space for them um so i think it's a real interesting challenge and i mentioned in the chat you know kiko lab when when lauren and charles were running kiko lab I would tune in. There'd be like six people from Africa. There'd be a person from from Belgium and three from France and two from from Germany and you know a bunch of U.S. folks. Maybe someone from Asia. Not so much because of the time time lags. Um, but that was an incredibly diverse uh, call. And there, no one, you know, people would would say, "Hey, you know, I live in a developing country. I'm in, I'm in a place where I don't have your level of education and and you know." Um, uh, socioeconomic status and, and we're poor here and you know but i'm trying to work on permaculture because i need to feed my people and you know it, those are incredibly important voices to include and we're not getting them here so um Kalia and i met through fabulous facilitators which is lisa heft and lisa you may know lisa from your open space days you know lisa yeah. used to say to me if you want latinos in your in your um group you need to put the invitation in spanish and go and post it in places where they're going to see it so you know it's one thing to say to people please invite someone else who doesn't look like you or or think like you it's quite another to actually go out there and be really active and say everybody you're you 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 have to go out there and find somebody younger or or different color or different education or different background and really make it attractive for them to show up and then we need to create the space for them to not feel like holy cow how do i talk in front of all these really smart people because that's very intimidating mm -hmm. i agree with that thank you uh dave uh yeah and sorry because i i raised my hand back before this conversation so i'm i'm a little bit out of sync but but maybe it ties back in i was so my framing of what ogm would like to do is uh, support large-scale collaboration. I kind of feel like the next generation of society, you know, we have government, we have businesses, but we don't have whatever is in addition. To that. So, uh, so it's the, that's what I think we're trying to do. And, and I think that facilitation is one of the technologies that we need for that, right? So I feel like the conversation around tech facilitation is really on, on point and like demonstrating good facilitation and and experimenting with it and stuff should be really central. Um, and, you know, it's so like, it's, it is funny to see everybody coming back together. Clearly. So I feel like we played with this stuff more 20 years ago, you know, and, and I feel like we, it, it's time to come back, you know, it's, it's another generation and we need to be doing it again. Um, and I, and so then the only other thing I was just going to add, add in the in the GRC, right? One we've had a, a bunch of issues, and we've had we had kind of a walkout by folks who saw the GRC as too colonialist, and and it's like I don't really know where to go with that, except to decide that the GRC is not going to be able to represent everybody for everybody. It doesn't it's not a, it doesn't make sense for me to reach out and say, okay, GRC is going to be diverse, but GRC could com, com participate in diversity, right? So so I wouldn't I don't know if OGM is going to ever be different than what OGM is today. But I think OGM could participate in a more diverse network, right? Which I think gets back to the, the cross fertilization problem, which then leads me to this. I stuck a link in the chat for uh, the um, Buckminster Fuller's playing with Wheelow. And I'm seeing a lot of people talking about Wheelow. I don't know, Gil, if Wheelow is a good platform, but I like the idea of having a presence that people could deal with synchronously that multiple organizations could play in. So this notion that we could actually create a, a you know a cyber world, and all of our entities could do our office hours in the same place, kind of, right? That seems kind of interesting to me. So like, what if we all set up offices kind of with BF next door to BFI, and somebody's there all the time? And I, Jerry, I probably learned about it from you, but didn't like in the old days, Joey Ito is basically always on IRC, right? Right. It's like where is our, our our IRC where there's there's always a touch point where there's a person right, that you can engage with? And could, could we recreate that? We sort of have that on the Mattermost chat server in some way. It's like, you know, you can post there in chat, there's the town squares, everybody, everybody on the server is on the town square channel that kind of exists that way. And, and it's not just one place, like the Joey's IRC channel was a singular channel, right? Uh, but it sort of plays that role. Yeah, I don't know. And, and I guess that, you know, that is the problem, even with Wheelow is like, everybody says, well, come to my platform, and then we'll have that role, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Hank Gilrick. 
Yeah, this has uh, been a very rich discussion. And I put a few things in the chat and I'd like to comment on almost everything that was said, but I'd just like to uh, keep to a couple of short comments. Uh, one is when I try to describe OGM to people, uh, no matter what I say or how long I talk about it, uh, they all nod and say, oh yes, so it's uh, a think tank. And uh, somehow uh, it's a think tank and there's not enough diversity in it. And that's true. And maybe it's too bad, but we should certainly uh, uh, cherish what we are. We are something special. And if it's just a think tank and it's not a do tank or it's a launching pad or it's uh, something more proactive and is mostly, uh, but not exclusively, older white guys. Okay, that's what it is. And uh, it's nourishing and we should be proud that it's gone so far. Uh, uh, yeah, about diversity, of course, if you want to, to get young people in a, in a group, you should put the advertisements and the invitations to places they go in the same for uh, any type of person that's not represented in a group. The question is, do we want that? Uh, and I'll leave it open. And finally, I'd like to comment about uh, uh, one comment on, on what should OGM do? And it's a reference to something Klaus said a long time ago in this conversation. I did put it in the uh, chat, uh, midwifing what wants to emerge or seems to want to emerge. And of all the different groups that I know of in the world, there's very few that actually take that type That's of, uh, that, that type of stance that they can help midwives or whatever term we want to use it, things that seem to want to emerge to come out. Uh, and uh, right after that, Grace said, it's so hard to say I need help. And that's absolutely true. So it has to be done in a way that uh, it's not humiliating people into saying we need help in cultures where that's just not done. But I think that's something that I definitely buy into aside from the, from the think tank and the pub aspects. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Hank. That's really um, that's really helpful. Um, Gil, then Rick, then we should probably wrap our call because we're at our at our time. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. So um, to Hank's thing, um, you know, um, we don't we don't always need to we don't always know to ask for help or what we need help with. Uh, so that's why I like the writers' workshop idea. Just like here's what I'm working on. What do you think? in a trusting environment where you can tell me, hey, you really need help with this because you don't have this piece together you know, where I might not know to ask. So that's a plus. Um, Dave, um, I, I don't get Wheelo, but I like the idea of having some common space where we all have office hours together. That's kind of intriguing to me. Uh, however, I need to have my door closed sometimes. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm working on hard this week is, is relearning how to have you know, two or three hours of solid time with nothing else happening than what I'm focusing on. Uh, so, um, you know, the open the open chat world is not going to serve me at this point, but I, I think there's something intriguing there. Um, on the diversity conversation, it's really important. And Clea, thank you for bringing it up and apologies for, you know, for us asking you to be the representative of the majority of humanity in this conversation. That's kind of unfair, but here you are. Um, um, are you still? Yeah, you are still here. Um, and I, um, what was it? Was it Grace who said this? Yeah, I don't. I, we don't need all conversations to be diverse. Some yes, some no. They don't need to all be to some standard of diversity, but we're clear that there's something missing here. Um, and um, um, a couple of things. Um, I'm not interested in us putting up ads somewhere to invite people into OGM, but I think that each of us knows people uh, who are not like us. And we talk about inviting people who are not like us, but have we actually done that? Uh, I've, I've done it with one person. She hasn't showed up yet. She has joined another kind of high level, smart, older white guys group that I'm in. Um, and, you know, um, 
in my experience, for a lot of people going into any group that's new is uncomfortable. Uh, and going into any group that's new and different is uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time, yeah, I mean, I remember my first time being in groups where I was the only one of like me, and it was awkward for me, and I had to deal with it, and I had to understand that, oh, this is how it you know, often is for other folks. Um, this 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 uh, young woman who I invited into this other old white guy discussion group was quiet through most of the first session, um, which I don't think is inappropriate for somebody who's new in a group. And then spoke out and spoke up and spoke up, you know, intelligently, forcefully, powerfully, you know, contributively. Um, so um, I'm comfortable with discomfort at a certain phase in the culture of a group. Uh, I also think there are ways that we can acknowledge that, let people know that, you know, you're welcome to participate at any point that you want. Um, uh, give space for silence. Uh, we talked, I think, last week about Qu the Quaker meeting process where we have, you know, we're quiet and wait for someone to speak who has maybe hasn't spoken before. Uh, Jerry, you've done that. You've done something like that sometimes. There's a plus there. So there are things we can do um, on that. Um, um, for me, that's not the central focus of what we're trying to do here, but it's certainly an important enrichment to what we're doing here and what we're trying to do in the world. So uh, more to say, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Gil. And just Eric, tell, tell us why the who came up. It's just uh, cause Kalia uh, is an identity woman. And um, I think of the song, Who Are You? So I make these connections ah, in my mind. Right. Yeah, there you go. So I didn't read it. Yeah, thank you. So maybe that should be Kalia's theme song is sort of what you're saying? Something like that. Who knows? Could already. Uh, be. Rick. Yeah, just just in the spirit of inclusiveness, um, the what Kayla brought up, I thought was incredibly important, and I think one of the most difficult thing for men to do is to uh, shut up, say nothing, don't be defensive, don't go and don't say anything about whether we're safe or not understand the other person's perspective. And my daughter taught me this many years ago when she told me that I was mansplaining. Um, and uh, she gave me the best ed education in this. And, and it's difficult to do, but it's called, it, therapeutically it's called validation, where you don't respond, you just understand the other. And, and that was very interesting that it, it triggered David's uh, reaction that people, we, we are not aware of our blind spots in the way that marginalizes people unintentionally from our perspective. From their perspective, that's different. But you have to find out more about the other to see if you can make it more inclusive and safe. And that takes work. So work in progress. Thanks, Rick. Anyone with any wrapping thoughts for this call? I, I've really enjoyed this call. I thought this was really fruitful and useful and I appreciate you all being here. Oh, I uh, have one idea very quickly. One is ahead. think about having a co-chair as a woman, an advisory group that's uh, interdisciplinary and transgenerational so that you, you and then you have those people part of different organizations so they can take the message from that back. I used to be on a, a professional liaison committee and that was my role responsibility to connect up with networks so you try and find the organization and you try and invite them to be on your advisory panel or board or whatever. So that's another way of trying to break down some of these um, implicit barriers, despite the fact we think we're being inclusive. Thanks, Rick. Judith um, has her hand up. I was just about to go to her. Uh, go ahead, Judy. Hey, sorry to jump in late on all of this. I've been no listening worries. just in curiosity. Um, I think there's a real issue when that all of us women have faced being few women walking into rooms full of men. And it's not something that you do comfortably, even if you're the outspoken, pretty confident kind of person that I am. You notice it and you know that you have to sort of be careful how you introduce yourself and there's a whole bunch of crummy dynamics. And it would be really helpful to find some number of larger women's groups and ask them to merge with us in some fashion so that we were bringing in a group of people, we could address numbers differently. And it concerns me too, that we have 
a very limited number of any other type of diversity as well, except possibly some invisible diversities that we wouldn't know about. And I think that if we want to really be effective in major social change, we need a much broader base of, of individuals than a group of, excuse me, but you know, highly educated, intelligent, articulate white men who are already in positions of influence. Um, and we're not really including the perspectives of a lot of other groups, except through those of us who reach out to those groups and can come in and say, well, I'm aware of this perspective or that perspective. So this would be a major shift in how we're doing things and um, needs to be thought through carefully. And I'm, I, I certainly value what we're doing as it is, but I think if we wanna make this actionable, we need a, a much more diverse base and a lot more uh, affiliations and multiple representations and we need numbers. Love that, Judy, thank you. Um, just uh, for grins, because we're talking about it in the chat a little bit about Witty. Uh, so I have a thought for women's networks, which includes Sisters, uh, WISE, the Transition Network, GraceNet, uh, Open Heroines, Women in Government, back to 1988, WIM, I don't, and I, don't, I know only a little bit about these, but I will put a link to this thought in the chat. Uh, in case anybody wants to look at them and see what's up. But uh, yeah, Whitney was founded, I think, by Anita Borg back in the day, like a really long time ago. And then I didn't know that it had become what you were talking about, Kalia. I also think it's really important that we look at, let's say, Indian networks, um, Pakistani networks, whatever they would be, because the cultural differences are significant between all of these different cultures. The gender one is actually more homogeneous across many different cultures than many other behavioral traits and customs. And so if we really wanna be the fully open community that would be my mm -hmm. ideal goal, we have to be inviting in and adapting to and accepting different forms of processing and communication. It's the same thing global business has to do. You know, if you're an American company and you go deal with the Japanese or the Chinese or the Koreans, that's different than how you deal with the South Americans. It's different than how you deal with various individual countries in Europe. And in each case, it's the, it's us that needs to accommodate their style. Exactly. Because otherwise we're not really partnering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, anyone else with any wrapping thoughts I have for a, this? I have call? a poem that I would like to read, if that's okay with people. Cool. Oh, and thank you. And it's dedicated to all the men on the call. This is from <laughs> Pablo Neruda. Now, we will count to 12, and we will all keep still for once on the face of the earth. Let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment, without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would not look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it's about. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving, and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves alive. Now I will count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. Thank you, Ken. <laughs>